The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about energy and climate issues. This is a topic we've talked about a lot in the past, but it's been pushed aside a little bit based on all the coverage we've been doing on debt, the Middle East, and everything that's been going on in the U.S.-China rivalry. But very important that we come back to this topic, in part because of some of the new developments that have been happening in China over the past year related specifically to coal Let's take a look at some of the new data coming out about Chinese coal production and coal power specifically in in China. And 2023 has marked a banner year. So local governments in China approved more new coal power in the first three months of 2023, okay, just in the first three months of this year than they did in the entire year back in 2021. And this is according to official documents as quoted by The Guardian, uh, between January and March of this year, get this, here's the numbers, 20.45 gigawatts of coal power was approved, which is almost a 40% increase compared to the same period last year. And just to put that in perspective, in all of 2021, they approved just 18 gigawatts of coal. So we're on a pretty treacherous path here in terms of Chinese coal production. Now, China relies on coal for more than half of its entire energy consumption. So that kind of explains why they're really ramping this up, especially as the economy is starting to show some signs of weakness. They want to make sure that the power keeps running. But China has a very important distribution problem because three quarters of China's coal, wind, solar, hydro resources, all of that Energy production tends to happen in the western side of the country, while the consumption of all of that energy tends to happen in the central and the eastern parts of the country. So they have a big challenge in transporting coal all the way over. Also, energy became a really big issue in the past couple of years. And last year, it was an acute issue when they ran into severe droughts in many parts of the country, particularly in the southwest around Chengdu and Sichuan province and out in Chongqing as well, when we saw a lot of rivers go dry. And that really caused a lot of problems because they rely on hydropower. And so there was a big boost in coal production to offset the drop in hydro. So it's very interesting, Kobus, that we hear a lot of rhetoric from China about their green energy development, their goals to cut back on carbon emissions and whatnot. But these coal numbers are very distressing. At the same time, One of the things that we've been noticing, Kobus, and you've been covering this as well as our new climate correspondent in Nairobi has also been covering this in Jenga, is that there are a lot of developments in the green energy space that the Chinese are financing in Africa. So in many ways, there's a schizophrenic story here between what China's doing at home and what they're doing abroad. Absolutely. You know, so of course, you know, Xi Jinping famously announced that they would be stopping overseas coal power development, I think in 2021. And since then, as you say, there's been a lot of these kind of smallest, beautiful, you know, projects around different aspects of sustainable energy generation and storage, like popping up in several African countries, including companies like Huawei kind of moving into electricity storage beyond its its normal telecoms operations. So that's very interesting. At the same time, we're also seeing now that China is cooperating with India and South Africa in trying to carve out what they call multiple pathways to a green transition to kind of add that language into an upcoming G20 communique. So this is probably not great news for the climate. Like some of those of the G20 members were trying to push for a hard date, you know, a hard deadline to be added to that communique to phase out fossil fuels. And now China seems to be leaning in with India and South Africa into a kind of a 
Yes, but, you know, kind of certain countries need to set their own timetables kind of narrative. So, you know, like I, I worry that that or I expect that that will probably get pulled into kind of broader geopolitical fights as well. But yeah, so it's a, it's a very mixed bag, you know, kind of like China's really playing lots of different roles on lots of different sides of this issue. Our new climate editor, as I mentioned, Njenga Akine, who has been covering these issues, and we're going to have him on the show to talk about this. If you go onto our website now, by the way, you'll see about two-thirds down on the homepage, a new section we've got called China Africa Climate News. And this highlights the smallest, beautiful types of projects that Kobus just talked about. Let me read you a couple of the headlines to give you a sense of what's going on, and it will really help to inform our discussion in today's show. Kenya's first Chinese-funded geothermal energy plant to inject 35 megawatts into the grid by June. That's in Kenya. Chinese-funded solar power plant uh, starts up in Central African Republic. Uh, Chinese company targets South Africa with renewable energy solutions. So again, this is what's happening in Africa and in other parts of the world, here in Vietnam as well. Lots of movement from the Chinese in the green energy space. But again, we've got a tail of two stories. So let's try and figure out what's going on in the Chinese coal and the climate space. And for that, there's no better person to have on the show than with us, our old friend, Christopher Nedapil Wong, who is an associate professor at the Fanhai International School of Finance at Fudan University in Shanghai, joining us today from Berlin. Christoph, it's wonderful to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Hey, Larry and Cole, it's so good to be back. So, Christoph, you wrote this article recently, and we're going to kind of dive into this again about the schizophrenic approach that we talked about, lessons from China's overseas coal exit and domestic support. And it really references this 2021 announcement by Chinese President Xi Jinping that Kobus talked about. And just before we get into our conversation, I think it'd be a good refresher for us to listen to the comments that President Xi made at the UN General Assembly in September of 2021 when he made the announcement that he would no longer or China would no longer fund overseas coal projects. Now, you're going to hear from the president delivering his address, but of course, this is the voice of a translator. China will strive to peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. This requires tremendous hard work, and we will make every effort to meet these goals. China will step up support for other developing countries in developing green and low-carbon energy, and will not build new coal-fired power projects abroad. And they lived up to that promise. They really did shut down Their coal projects in Africa, some of the projects that we were following, the Senghua power plant in Zimbabwe, that got shut down. The Limpopo power plant in South Africa also got shut down. So they definitely lived up to this. Christoph, you wrote in this article that was published earlier this year, some believe that this decision was driven by international pressure. These are your words. Yet this notion seems incomplete and risks misguiding countries' environmental cooperation strategies with China. Let's pick up the conversation there. What is misguided about our understanding of that decision? I mean, what I try to answer in this article and in this research is actually what drove the decision to exit overseas coal. And uh, as you said, kind of this dichotomy between domestic coal support and the overseas uh, exit. Indeed, the notion that the, when the G7 said we have to exit coal or when the U.S. says uh, we have to pressure China to, uh, to kind of reduce its overseas coal or also European leaders say kind of that's going to be high on our agenda. That notion seems to be, I think, misguided. Uh, That's what I said, because the international pressure to uh, China to do something in the environmental space and to potentially influence China on this seems relatively limited and potentially also even more limited in recent times due to the political disagreements and conflicts that we are having. Yeah, you said it's not only misguided, but it's also counterproductive. How is that counterproductive? Well, I think it's counterproductive if you don't understand the underlying reasons what actually drove this coal exit decision, particularly the overseas coal exit decision, also what drives the expansion of domestic coal. If you think that it's simple political pressure that can lead to this exit decision, then this is misguided. And then it kind of also, of course, leads to the wrong conclusions that you should um, uphold or even increase the, the pressure. Rather than 
actually trying to figure out what is relevant for China. Why are they kind of exiting coal? And so this is really kind of the, the question that we that I drove into this research. So what are the drivers? Why did China exit uh, overseas coal? So and this is, I mean, I, I can uh, share with you some of the findings, of course, here if you're interested. Please do. Yeah, yeah. That's, that'd be great. Yeah. So the first question that I tried to answer is kind of, why did we have so much coal? Why did China became the largest public financier of overseas coal. And what was really fascinating, it's not as big, uh, first of all, as we think it is. It's, it was about 56 gigawatts that China supported in overseas coal. So it's not kind of, it's it's not as big as uh, the domestic coal, but it's still substantial. And they were able to do that because they were really experts in building coal-fired power plants. And they had it and kind of the financing model all figured out, the construction model all figured out, and they just exported pretty much exactly and the domestic model to overseas. That means often with sovereign guarantees, which is just kind of that the host government has to pay for the, the energy, for the power, even if the customers don't pay for the power, the government still um, has to pay the Chinese developers and the Chinese project owners. And that's, by the way, a, a big problem, for example, in countries like Pakistan, where the Chinese really get money from the government, even though the coal-fired power plant are loss making. So very strong model. But now kind of something changed and something changed particularly after 2020 in, in the middle of COVID and potentially a little bit before. So we saw strong changes in the host country behavior that suddenly demanded that coal-fired power plants would be phased out. And we saw the case of Bangladesh, where the Bangladeshi government said, like, we, I know we have this agreement with China, but please, let's not focus on these coal-fired power plants, but shift the investment to something else, ideally renewables. We had the case in Egypt, where a 6.6 gigawatt coal-fired power plant was agreed. And then the Egyptian government said, we actually don't want this. And potentially, because we don't have as much power demand as we thought, or the uh, alternatives, green energy might actually be cheaper. We had social reasons. So kind of we had kind of the political or the, the kind of the whole scale, uh, country reason. And then kind of the social reasons were also quite interesting. And you guys covered this as well. And the Lamo coal-fired power plant were really the social movement against this coal-fired power plant led to the decision by the Kenyan courts to stop the further construction of this coal-fired power plant. It was a 1.2 gigawatt um, coal-fired power plant, which is quite big and potentially was also necessary for power at some point, but it had to be stopped because of the social pressure. Then we saw this letter of 263 environmental NGOs from different host countries, and it was sent to the Chinese government in April 2020. That was also... I think kind of showing that the host countries themselves and the societies in the host countries themselves were not as positive about coal fired power plant as we thought. And then we had financial reasons from the Chinese side. And um, so if you kind of operate a coal fired power plant, if you and the Chinese often operate, they don't only build a coal fired power plant, they also operate it. So as owners. Um, and so what do you care about is cost. Um, and what we saw over the last years is a 40% um, coal price uh, increase in the coal price volatility. So how, how fluctuating is the coal price? And that, of course, it makes it very difficult to plan for your cost. We also saw an ex actual coal price increase, so 30% increase in coal price. Now that makes the operation, of course, very expensive. A spread of emission trading systems, so carbon pricing, that also kind of is challenging the future of coal um, fired power plants and how do we price emissions? And then actually a cost, an increase in financing costs. So how much um, do you actually pay interest rates, so to say, on financing or refinancing coal fired power plants? And these were all kind of important. It's a, it's a mix of reasons that led in the end to a situation where after 51 coal fired power plants that were announced, um, so outside of China, with the support of China, so these were announced between 2014 and 2020, 51 coal-fired power plants. Only one plant became operational. 25 plants were shelved, eight were canceled. So that was, I think, a very stark reminder that building coal-fired power plants abroad is by far not as easy as domestically. And so I think that also led into a situation where kind of the business case for coal-fired power plants abroad was much weaker um, than domestically. So a few months ago, we spoke with experts on the Chinese solar energy and industry. And, you know, it was this really like eye-popping kind of conversation just to kind of really get to grips with how huge the scale of the solar industry is in China, like what these kind of like mega factories look like, actually. And, you know, a lot of, I think for even for extremely rich countries, 
China's renewables in industry is basically the envy of the world. You know, it's, it's, it's such a big industry. You know, kind of that then also understanding the huge amount of energy and, and investment that is still going into domestic coal now is kind of difficult for me to understand. So I was wondering, what are some of the factors that are driving China to keep investing in coal so much domestically when they also have such a robust renewables industry? Right. I think this is exactly kind of this panda dragon phenomenon. Kind of we're seeing a simultaneous expansion of the renewables and of the coal fire power plant. And so kind of is China the greenest country? Yes, in terms of a renewable um, energy, it is definitely a leading country and the world's leading kind of contributor to solar technologies. But it's also this massive coal expansion. The reasons that I believe kind of drives this and kind of this is also what I wrote in this article is that the economic reasons for China for domestic coal are very different for its economic kind of considerations overseas. One aspect is that 90% of the coal is domestic. Um, so they're still kind of the largest importer of coal. So 10% of their coal is imported, but 90% is domestic. So these coal mines have a lot of jobs. Also the um, coal plants um, provide a lot of jobs. And the coal mines actually make money. So considering that Maybe we believe that a coal-fired power plants don't make as much money. That might be true, but you still have a massive industry in the coal mining in China that makes a lot of money. And it also allows China to support kind of the coal-fired power plants in reducing the coal price, limiting the coal price to reduce their losses or provide direct financial support through the central banks or the People's Bank of China through some specific credit lines to pop up the financials of the coal-fired power plants. So from an economic perspective, it's not as bad domestically to operate coal-fired power plants as it would be abroad. And I think also we don't have kind of the social pressure as we have overseas. There's, of course, a different civil society and the ability for civil society to organize in China than in many of the other countries. And now, kind of all of this um, mix makes it extremely politically risky for China to move out of coal. Because you have all these people dependent on it, you don't know exactly who is all involved in uh, kind of financially also in the coal, which financial institutions, which state-owned enterprises are actually dependent on coal. And if you would shut it down, what would be the cost? So then it makes sense to actually support it because the economy in many ways not only depends on the power that the coal-fired power plants produce, but also on the jobs and the money. Well, that's not an equation that is unique to China. In South Africa, Cobus, where you are, one of the problems is that 100,000 people are tied to the coal industry as well. And the government and the ANC has been reluctant to take strong actions against the coal industry and to bring in green energy because they're afraid of undermining that industry. Let's be very honest here. That is the argument that Joe Manchin in the United States and the Republicans also say that the oil and gas industry and the coal industry are key employers. So this is not a unique argument to China. By It's the same equation that I think politicians everywhere around the world. The problem is, though, is that the Chinese now are the world's largest emitter, not on a per capita basis, but on an absolute basis. And in many ways, when President Xi says they're going to be carbon neutral by 2060, and they throw out all these numbers. To me, it feels a little bit like, you know, when they say we're only peeing in one third of the pool. <laughs> okay, so great that they've cut their funding for international, but if they're polluting domestically, at the end of the day, the climate doesn't really care. Okay, right? So I'm just wondering how seriously we should take China's climate commitments and the pronouncements of carbon neutrality and all of the efforts that it's supposedly trying to make at places like the COP summits and whatnot, when in fact they are spending so much and expanding their coal industry. And as you've pointed out, the politics make it impossible to really sharply contract that industry. So how seriously should we take Chinese commitments on carbon emissions specifically related to coal? Yeah, I think that's kind of the beauty about China and many, many other countries. And if we observe China, then kind of everybody has an opinion about China and, and tries to make sense of it. And so I'll, I'll try to throw in my two cents into that. And I never heard this teeing in the pool just in one third. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, I mean, it's basically the same concept. Like <laughs> you think you're getting away from it just because at the end of the pool, the little boys and girls are peeing in it, but you're still in that pool with them. Absolutely. I think it's it's a fantastic metaphor. So my, my hunch is, 
that the main focus right now is on the 2030 goal and not necessarily um, so strongly on the 2060 goal. The 2030 goal is that we peak carbon emissions before 2030. Now, I think it's a very noble goal potentially, but also a very challenging goal for a number of reasons. Number one is, of course, what does it mean to peak? At what level do we peak? So are we doubling emissions until 2030? Of course, we, hopefully not, but it's conceptually possible. So I think kind of from a political trajectory, it is very unclear what we will actually do until 2030. The uh, second aspect is in for any investor, they are also not sure what's happening over the next five to seven years. So if there would be a clear goal to say like, okay, we peak emissions, for example, at that level, and this is kind of our trajectory, how we get there. So there would be the necessity for clear plans. Where do we want to be and how do we get there? Then it would be a very clear path also for a number of different financial investors to say kind of, this is the this is the um, targets that we have in terms of financing. And then similarly, also for China, which is interesting, is that China has an emission trading system. It is in some ways euphemistically the largest emission trading system in the world because, of course, the number of allowances are so big that it becomes the largest emission trading system. That an emission trading system does not work properly if you don't reduce the allowances. And right now, we don't know really how to reduce the allowances until 2030. And so there is no scarcity. There is no scarcity on which um, the emission trading system could trade. So there's kind of a number of problems with this 2030 goal, which kind of also lead to this potential increase in coal-fired power plants. Um, in the article, you make the point that it's really an under, you know, a, mis- a misunderstanding to just assume that the reason why China, re- you know, re- retreated from international coal f- financing is because of international political pressure. But at the same time, you also make the point that that the UN is provides this kind of interesting neutral space for China to position itself as an environmental actor. So in that context, I was wondering you know, kind of how you see these kind of international climate politics for China developing over, you know, over the next while. Like, for me, one of the very interesting data points was was this moment at COP27, the last climate summit late last year, where there was a moment where, you know, in general, China, you know, at these summits are always trying to position itself as part of a global South coalition. But in this case, there was these calls from small island states for China and India to, to also contribute to payments for loss and damage. And that got kind of quickly like shuffled away, you know, quickly dismissed by the Chinese delegation. But it was a very kind of revealing moment about a possible kind of developing crack in the South-South coalition for China. So I was wondering, you know, kind of how you see this kind of multilateral politics developing for China over the next few years. Right. So what, what I kind of wrote in this article is it was interesting the choice of the venue where China announced this coal exit. There were three main events that were potentially relevant where China could have announced this coal exit. There was the Boao Forum, um, so it's a mostly Asia forum, and kind of the decision most likely had been taken by then already to exit coal, so it could have been announced there. But the Boao Forum is relatively Asia-focused and does not have this global um, gravity. We had the COP um, in Glasgow um, in 2021, so the climate COP, where, of course, such an announcement could carry a lot of weight because it's climate. But then kind of doing this at the COP would also require China to share some of the praise for this decision with the host, the, the presidency of the COP, which was the UK, and potentially that would was not in their interest, or it would have been seen as kind of Yes, China um, kind of announced this, but got something else in return, so it was a bargaining chip. And so it was very interesting, in my opinion, that they chose the United Nations General Assembly, which is a super neutral um, space and has this global relevance. And of course, then creates this image of China being a very green country. And the year before China announced this um, 2030 and 2060 targets, which is also in many ways a surprise for many, including in China, um, very, very few people knew about this sudden ambition of the 2030 and 2060 targets. And I think more knew about this coal exit, but it was nevertheless kind of this United Nations kind of, we use the multilateral system, we work in the multilateral system, and we want to be seen as a global um, green leader. So there's definitely, it seems, an ambition to expand the green soft power, um, as they call it, for China by utilizing these venues. Now, whether there are cracks, I think so far, talking with a lot of 
folks also um, from the global south, from developing countries, it seems there's a strong belief that China is a very green country. And I even hear that sometimes kind of in Germany, it's like, oh, no other country has more electric cars, no other country has more renewable energy. And so there is kind of a, not a bad communication from China to portray itself as a very green country that really pushes through a lot of these kind of new technologies. Now, the re reality for China is, of course, also domestically a lot more complex. You have a number of, I think, very green-minded policymakers, university and think tanks that really understand some of the risks, including in the financial sector, that understand the risk of climate change and really want to accelerate some of this greening. And then there's, of course, other voices. And it's not unlike many other countries where you have political dispute and maybe it's not carried out as much in public. And that's why it seems more top down in China. But of course, there's also ample discussions going on within China. What's the right um, pathway? Yeah, that's what makes it so fascinating is that if you only look at China as the largest emitter, then you're missing the other side of the story, which is that the largest producer of green energy. And if you only look at China as the largest producer of green energy and say green mobility, then you're missing the other part on emissions. So both sit side by side, which make it absolutely fascinating. It's interesting because climate is seen as one of the potentially last areas where the United States and China might be able to cooperate together. So the climate lead in the United States, John Kerry, has gone to China on a number of occasions. They kind of reserve climate as an area of collaboration. That being said, not a lot has been done. There is a lot of concern that even that will break down. The Chinese broke off climate talks after Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan last year. So it is vulnerable and susceptible to the geopolitics of the moment. How do you see it, especially because you spend a lot of time in China, in terms of the potential for China to collaborate with the United States? Because at the end of the day, if the U.S. and China are not working together, it's really going to be hard to find a universal solution to this problem. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I would also kind of throw Europe a little bit into the ring as, I think, also a very important partner for uh, climate negotiations and, of course, also climate technologies and climate finance. Without strong collaboration on joint goals, I think it will be kind of very challenging to make the necessary progress for a green transition. I think that competition in many ways is good and kind of being able to have more diversified supply chains of uh, green technologies is also not a bad idea as long as it the standards are similar enough so you don't have, you're not locked into a one system like the Chinese system or the US system or the European system and therefore kind of really are in the sphere of influence. So kind of having common standards also in, in terms of technology would be extremely important. And I think this is an area where we really have to work a lot harder to find common ground. I think on the overall goal of kind of, yes, we have to address climate and on the overall kind of realization, wow, it's actually not only a threat, but also a business model. I think everybody is getting on this train now, which is fantastic. It's very different from a couple of years ago, but you really have to make much more efforts in terms of collaborating on joint goals, joint pathways, at least kind of in terms of how do we re want to reduce the, the emissions? How do we measure emissions? And then, of course, also technological standards for all the green technologies that we're developing. And I think there's too little collaboration. One of my fears is actually, of course, that we're breaking down into these blocks that everybody is kind of in their own sphere of influence. One of the kind of, we just built some scenarios also for kind of this global coal transition. And one of the scenarios that we're having is choosing your allies. That really shows, okay, so China is, is trying to pull more countries into their sphere of influence. Of course, the US is trying to pull more countries into their sphere of influence. And then there's all of the other countries that kind of have to choose with whom they're working, which currency that they're, they're using. So kind of over the next couple of years, we'll Kind of, this is one of my worrisome scenarios that I think we all have to work hard to keep building bridges and keep up the communication. You know, in that context, we've seen the announcement of a lot of new climate-related funding coming from the G7, and, you know, particularly also in relation to Africa. And I was wondering, you know, kind of what you know kind of what you make of that and like like kind of how optimistic it makes you in in terms of you know in, in terms of overcoming this kind of 
the, the, some of these barriers, but particularly also, you know, in, in, in facilitating broader and more complex kind of supply chains and sectors um, in these countries? Like, A, how optimistic are you that these this kind of like funding will actually help to change things? And then B, what are some of the barriers to its success? Well, I think that's an excellent question. Also, it ties into last week's discussion, I think, with Jackson Wade, who said many of the countries need actually to improve their kind of attractiveness for foreign direct investment. And I think this is absolutely to the point. We need to, I think one of the fantastic things that we've achieved in the particularly green energy space and particularly in solar is that it's not such a high technology as it used to be before. So manufacturing can be much more local. And if you look at big countries in the global south that have massive demand for solar panels, how can we also kind of attract investments so we have manufacturing in these countries of these not so high tech, but still high tech industries that also then creates jobs and uh, allows kind of for this for this green transition. I think there's a lot of work needed in terms of kind of local institutions that um, attract such financing, but of course also then the support from let's say developing finance institutions to de-risk some of the capital. Of course, if you're investing in in the global south, well, uh, kind of the promises that we've seen also from the G7, I think. Let's see kind of how, how they all play out. I think the we have seen a number of initiatives from the G7, the Build Back Better initiatives, the Global Gateway. Um, and of course, these are challenging times and it's challenging to really set up a big scheme. And also China with its Belt and Road initiative didn't immediately take off in 2013, but kind of grew and, and also kind of had a lot of learning moments that were not cheap. So it takes time, but I... In a positive sense, I'm hopeful that we can achieve it. Currently, we're not kind of seeing sufficient investments in the global south for the um, transition. And I think we, you guys talked about it so often already. Yeah, I want to very quickly shift gears before we go, because I know you're, you're very busy today. You and your colleague at Fudan University, uh, Zhong Zhicheng, together you guys wrote a new blog post on the Panda Paw Dragon Claw blog. By the way, if you're not familiar with Panda Paw Dragon Claw, it is really one of the most indispensable blogs on Chinese development. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. We're going to put an article link also to this post that you did. And it's entitled China's Role in Addressing Post-COVID Debt Challenges in the Global South. You're one of the rare scholars who has an expertise in both climate issues and debt issues as well. This is very timely given everything that we've been covering over the past few months with the Chinese and the debt relief processes underway in Sri Lanka, in Zambia, in Ethiopia, and Ghana, and elsewhere. You noted in this blog post with uh, Jertung that China's debt exposure to DSSI countries, that's the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, decreased for the first time. And by the end of 2021, your research found the outstanding public external debt owed to China in the 68 DSSI-eligible countries – fell from 110 billion in 2020 to just 104 billion. So that's not a huge decrease. Why is this important? Give us the significance of this development. I think it's significant in a sense that it's good that overall debt levels are kind of at least try to be under control so that we're not expanding Chinese debt. And China has, of course, been singled out and one of the most important bilateral lenders in a lot of these uh, countries. And so understanding China's role in the DSSI, in this kind of DSSI, as you said, is debt service suspension initiative. Those are um, countries that are close to or at risk of kind of sovereign defaults. Um, and so understanding China's role in this is very important for an informed discussion. And seeing that China is, of course, not, sec not, not fully succeeding in solving the debt, debt crisis, but also right now not exacerbating it, I think it's, a, it's an important notion that we're, we're trying to add here as well. Not to say that in any ways we're solved on this debt uh, challenge, but just trying to understand a little bit the numbers. So as there's been more and more controversy around the growing debt crisis in some global South countries, there's also been, as you mentioned, a lot of pressure on China in, in, in terms of how they lend and a lot of scrutiny on, on the specifics of Chinese lending. Um, and particularly also like the difficulties in the Chinese domestic in like lending industry or financial architecture to deal with issues like, like debt write-offs, for example. So I was wondering, from your perspective, like how much appetite do you think there is in China to explore innovative 
financing mechanisms to f- around climate solutions particularly. Are you seeing attention paid to mechanisms like debt for climate swaps, for example, or other other similar kind of blue sky thinking in relation to, to how we might be able to fund the Global South kind of climate transitions in the future? Thanks so much, Kobus. This is such a good question. So we have been trying to work with Chinese government, the gov- government institutions, to understand their appetite, particularly for debt for nature swaps and debt for climate swaps and potentially also for debt for health swaps. So I think kind of your the listeners here mostly know what uh, these types of swaps are, but kind of just very briefly, the idea is that rather than fully rep- having to repay your debt, which is most likely impossible anyway, because these countries are in debt distress or close to debt distress, the idea is, can we not swap some of the debt and protect nature instead. So rather than repaying, as we had kind of the case in in uh, the Seychelles, for example, rather than repaying all of the debt in, or in Fiji, rather than repaying all of the debt, the Fiji then sets aside 30% of its kind of marine area um, as a protected area. And so we have kind of protection of nature. We have green development, local kind of benefits from it, because of course, fisheries usually also benefit from protecting fisheries. They might not be able to fish in these 30%, but overall the fish stock increases. So it kind of this is the idea of a debt for nature swap. It's ideally a win-win-win situation, a win for the um, debt debtor country, a win also for the creditor country, not only in, in kind of green credibility, but also in making sure that this kind of the rest of the debt gets um, paid back. And then of course a, a win for nature. Now, very specifically, China has been looking into a number of different kind of forms of debt reorganization, including debt for nature swaps and debt for climate swaps. I was involved in study, which uh, we completed for the uh, uh, Research Bureau of the People's Bank of China and the Green Finance Committee, where we also kind of, again, were invited to talk about debt for nature swaps and also um, evaluated some of the cases like Lao that could be very um, interesting to apply a debt for nature swap because Lao has a lot of um, exposure to Chinese debt. Lao has kind of unprotected priority areas, meaning kind of very kind of intact nature that should be protected but is currently not protected. And Lao has also come up publicly to say we are interested in evaluating a debt for uh, nature swap. So this is kind of discussions that are ongoing. We don't have, if for China, it's challenging um, to engage right now in such kind of innovative forms, because compared to other countries like Germany, France, and um, the US, those countries have a policy around debt for nature swaps. It's clearly stated in their regulations that they can apply some of the debt for debt for nature swaps. Germany even has a number, I think it's 150 million uh, euros a year, that they can kind of swap their um, debt for nature in, in specific eligible countries. China does not have such a policy. And as you guys noted, I think also Shang Xingwei said it, for loan offers uh, in China Exim Bank or China Development Bank, such a decision is impossible to make. So you have to have a top level policy to kind of even properly engage in such discussions. And so currently none such policy exists, but discussions internally are ongoing and how and whether to proceed with such more innovative and also kind of green treatment of debt. Christoph Nadepil Wong is an associate professor at the Fanhai International School of Finance at Fudan University in Shanghai. He is also the author of two articles that I'm going to put in the show notes that we've discussed today, Lessons from China's Overseas Coal Exit and Domestic Support. That was a fantastic paper that was in the journal Science, if I recall. Also, China's role in addressing post-COVID debt challenges in the Global South on the Panda Paw Dragon Claw blog. Both of them are essential reading to understanding two of the critical trends impacting China's engagement in the Global South, green energy and debt. Christoph, thank you so much both for the articles and for joining us today. It was wonderful to get your insights. If people want to follow the work you're doing at uh, Fudan University, where can they find you? To be the best is the website of the Green Finance and Development Center, which is greenfdc.org. Okay, we'll put a link to that. There's some fantastic reports that come out of there. We feature Christoph's all the latest writings and all the reports that you guys do in our newsletter, and we really appreciate you joining us today. 
Thank you. And it's such a pleasure to be back here. Um, you guys do such a fantastic job, not only, of course, here in this podcast, but again, in your newsletter and in your web website, you guys are an indispensable source for information. So uh, keep it up. Focus, as in so many issues in the China Global South relationship, how you look at China really depends on where you're looking from and what you're looking for. And I think Christoph really highlights the complexities of it. So when you hear the critics of China say they're the worst polluter in the world, they're the reason why we're having all these problems, they're right. They're absolutely right. However, they're only telling you half the story. And I think it's really important to see the other half of the story, that China is by far the world's leader when it comes to green transition, green mobility, green technology. I mean, they are so far ahead. And if you haven't spent time in China recently, you can't imagine it. And it's a point that you have brought up on a number of occasions just in the transportation business, that in the United States, for example, if you want to buy an EV, you have to be prepared to spend $100,000 or $80,000 for a Tesla. It's at the high end of the market. In China, BYD is launching a whole series of new cars in the $10,000 space, and they have even in the sub-$10,000 space. They have electric tricycles, they have electric mopeds, they have electric bicycles. Every part of the mobility chain is electrified now. That is incredible. And at the same time, you see these vast solar fields and whatnot. The problem is, and I come back to the point that I brought up with Christoph, is that they may be doing these wonderful things both domestically in the new energy space and also these noble things about cutting coal financing overseas. But if they are increasing coal production as much as they are, it doesn't really matter. And I'm going to bring us back to that awful, awful statement by John Kerry in Senegal a few months ago or last year. Remember when he was really kind of putting the burden on the Senegalese to say, well, Mother Nature doesn't care where it comes from. You know, F you, John Kerry, you cannot say that to people who are literally generating none of the output of this, okay? And he and his private jets and his billionaire friends are just have a carbon footprint the size of King Kong. That being said, his point is defensible in one sense that Mother Nature doesn't care. Again, it's like that point that I was saying about peeing in one third of the pool. So here we have this real dilemma about what China's doing, which is great, and what China's doing, which is terrible. I think, yes, that is a big dilemma. And it's really kind of like what people call a wicked problem. But I think, you know, maybe one way to move forward is to think of what China's role could be for the next kind of upcoming block of development that has to happen in the world. You know, so as you mentioned, you know, China managed to find a way of making money at the bottom end of the labor market through things like electric tricycles, for example, these kind of like little three-wheel mini trucks that you would use to like move a, a chest of drawers around, for example. You know, like, like China's streets are full of those. And those are exactly the kinds of technologies that African countries, for example, would need. And that that, that would make a, a, a really significant kind of jump in African development, particularly if they also paired with renewable energy, which China is also good at. So, you know, so in that sense, one doesn't necessarily have to only run up against these kind of contradictions of China's you know, domestic policy, which obviously, as, as Christoph pointed out, has a lot of poli domestic politics riding around it. But one might be able to approach it from the direction of how to kind of work with China in a way that is friendly to everyone, particularly to global South countries that are still trying to make that first jump into mass mobility, for example. You know, um, so kind of getting it right the first time around in, you know, in a country where there isn't you know, widespread kind of car use yet, or, you know, where it, it's possible to, for a whole whole kind of block of new young people moving into mobility, to move into electric mobility supported by renewable energy right from the start. China could be, and I think would be the key partner in, in that kind of transition. So, you know, so, so that there may be kind of ways around this kind of like massive problem that, we, that we're talking around at the moment. So the themes that we raised in today's show are what we're going to be doing a lot more of on the platform going forward, basically. We now have dedicated China climate reporters in Southeast Asia. Antonio Timmerman, a reporter based in Jakarta, is now on our team, as well as Njenga Akina, who is in Nairobi, only talking about regional China climate issues. So if you're interested in this topic, and you should be, 
Go to our site. You can see right there China Africa climate news, and we're going to add an ASEAN climate news section as well because this touches absolutely everything, and it's essential. This is available to our subscribers. If you would like to get the information that we are bringing every single day, and that Christoph gets in his news box delivered every afternoon, his time, go to ChinaGlobalSouth.com/slash/subscribe. We would be thrilled for you to join our reader community, and we have half off discounts for students and teachers. Just Send me an email, Eric at ChinaGlobalSouth.com, and I will give you the links for those discount codes. Please remember to use your academic email address when you contact me. So that'll do it for this edition of the China Global South podcast. Copes and I will be back again next week with another edition of the show. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City for Copes van Staden in Johannesburg. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show, or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com, where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com. <laughs>